Right, now I've had quite a few um, people say they can't make it today, but uh, I'm not going to go through the list because there's quite a few and that takes time up as well. Um, so first of all, we're doing February today. Any February throughout the war, okay? Anything we can think about February throughout the war. I've read, I think what I'm going to do is every month I'm going to write a summary. Now I've written a summary this time, and what I'll do is I'll read out the summary, then we'll go into whatever people want to talk about. First of all, um, uh, sorry to hear about James Hook. Uh, 99, his birthday w would have been July. He died this month. Um, I have put a page on the Roll of Honor, so um, so that's 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 on there. Uh, his his uh, funeral is this. I think it's the seventeenth. That is on our Facebook. I think it's the seventeenth of February at two uh, two o'clock at Brandon St Peter's Church. So uh, if anyone wants to make it, anyone who's listening, who isn't here, who's listening to this recording, um, if you'd like to make it, have a look at the times. They are on Facebook. Um, right. Uh, it's, it's been quite a busy month for me because I've, ha I've had quite a few people get in touch and want not only from Facebook, but just getting in touch asking me if I'd add their relation or father or grandfather to the role of honour, so it's been quite busy. Um, but what I'll do is I'll read out the summary. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out now all together because there's two and a half pages. Um, and then that might jog people's memory or whatever. Okay, so here we go. <coughs> Uh, February's uh, 1920 to 42 to 46. <clears throat> I've included 46 because it's near the beginning and some were still being repat repatriated at that at a long that time. So, right, 1942, 8th of February, the Japanese launched their attack on Singapore Island and quickly gained a foothold on the northeast coastal area, pushing back the Australian troops defending this area. 10th or 11th, or 10th and 11th, this is the night of, uh, Indian Armoured Corps went into battle for Singapore with movement towards the Mac Ritchie Reservoir to help counterattack the, 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 to help their counterattack by Tom Force. At Swiss Hill, they held up part of the 5th Imperial Japanese Infantry Division until the 4th Suffolk arrived to add their strength for the night. There are reports contradicting this as there were no British tanks, but they were armoured cars, they weren't tanks. The Japanese had tanks. 11th of February, three of the 15 inch guns of the Johor battery had turned their guns 180 degrees to fire on targets on the Bukit, I think I'll spell it, I'll say it right, Bukit Timur area, firing 2,000 pounds armoured piercing shells into the advancing Japanese. The 18th Re Reconnaissance Battalion, using 10 Indian armoured carriers, attacked astride the road towards Bukit Timur and were put out of action by anti-tank fire and Japanese tanks, killing their commander, Lieutenant J.M. Wise. The remaining armoured cars withdrew. By 8 p.m., all the Tom Force counterattack were back behind the morning start lines. So, although they gained the area, they did give it up and got back as they were at the beginning of the day. The 12th of February, the situation in Singapore became critical. Coastal defence guns were de demolished by explosives. Changi garrison was ordered to retreat 40 miles to Singapore City. 
the 13th of February, the coastal defence guns personnel formed into the British Infantry Battalion. C civilian casualties were very high. Water shortage. Your light's gone out, Ron. <laughs> 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 We look at you, Barbara. It's all right. That's better. <laughs> I'll put a mask on. <laughs> oh, poor Ronnie's been cut off. Oh, dear. Maybe it's the storm because it's, yeah. it's pretty bad yeah. here. Yeah. What storm? We got sunshine here. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all the sunny and real it. Yeah, it never rains. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, if, he's got, if he's got a power cut, he's not coming back, is he? No, no. no. Uh, well, I've got something, if, if we don't want to wait. Um, um, as most yeah, of you know, I, I, I run a group. Uh, well, not I don't run a group. We have a group, the Birmingham Association of FIPO. Um, and uh, we've widened our remit to include people from other areas. Uh, I'm also in contact um, with Keith Bettany. You, you all heard of Keith Bettany and his dad, Des, who did all the artwork. And last September, as part of one of our meetings, um, we usually go when, when it's the surrender or when it's the uh, fall of Japan um, anniversaries, we usually go to a church in Birmingham. But last September, they couldn't um, uh, allow us uh, to use it. It was booked for something else. And so my plans to um, do something for Des Bettany failed and Keith had sent me this handwritten this isn't the oh. obviously this is a copy um, piece by his father and because of the recent ongoing um, exhibition in Liverpool um, I thought it was very relevant that perhaps you know we mentioned that the letter contains the details of his experience I mean I've written this out ready for Tuesday I mean I don't know whether you want to hear what Des is does put about this while we wait to see if Ron comes back. Yeah, yeah. It is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. This is a personal account by a FIPO. If, if you'd like me to, I'll, I'll read out what he put. Um, Keith's on holiday. <laughs> Australia's have them um, lots of holidays when they retire, not like us Brits. Um, so I'll read it to you. If Ron comes back on and I need to stop, then that's fine. Um, anyway, uh, this is what Des wrote. February 1942 to September 1945. On our arrival in Singapore in Coffee. November 1941, Sweet. we Coffee. entrained up country. Now, some Coffee. of you can perhaps help because it's difficult to read his writing. Up country to Mantin, I don't, or Maritin. And the unit, the 88th Field Regiment Royal Artillery, became part of the 9th Indian Division. And the three batteries were sent to Ipo, Ipo? Is next Ipo. I couldn't un Ipo. Al Alor Star? something like that, and Kuantan, when the repulse and the Prince of Wales were sunk. Eventually, the battery was moved over Fraser's Gap to the west coast, south of Kuala Lumpur, and took part in the fights, skirmishes and battles down the peninsula to Singapore. After capitulation, we were all marched to Changi after disabling our guns. I mean, that's a bit that's relevant, I suppose, for today. But, um, you know, if you're interested, I'll read out. His, his own feelings about it all. Shall I carry on or you got? Yeah, yeah keep oh, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. passage of 50 years, because this is, I say, this was written in 1991, has reduced the mass of incidents and memories as POWs to general feelings, impressions and attitudes. Between February the 15th, 1942 and September 1945, the completely alien existence we led has become blurred. What is left is a lasting, profound distrust of and dislike of the Japanese and Koreans. What is clear that throughout the period of privation, starvation and slavery, hope, faith and confidence in our eventual release remained optimistically constant. Rumours abounded, but I particularly remember the night of the D-Day landings in Normandy. When the report reached us, the whole camp within and without the jail began to stir and murmur, and much to the consternation of the Japanese. This was accepted as fact, but the stories of the Hiroshima bombing and the Nagasaki bombing with atomic bombs were met with total disbelief. 
Some things remain clear, however, in the never-ending struggle for means to bolster woefully insufficient Russians. The treatment of working parties by third-class Japanese, Korean and Korean privates, some of whom had never seen a European for, before. The roadside display of <coughs> severed heads, the bashings and torture of Chinese and Indian labourers, as well as POWs, and the complete disregard of the sick and injured by the Japanese. But there was also the ingenious use of natural and primitive materials to manufacture a wide range of necessary everyday items and the extreme resourcefulness shown in building accommodation, chapels, theatres and essentials. The concerts, shows and plays were quite excellent, as were talks and lectures by experts. Many miracles of surgery occurred under very trying situations and conditions. At an early date, working parties left Changi for camps in the, now I think he put Towner Road and the Sarangoon Road, etc. We worked at clearing up the damage in Singapore and the dock areas. For a while, we collected abandoned military and private transport. What could not be prepared was broken up and shipped to Japan as scrap. Ingenious methods of sabotage were used both here and with, uh, in other working parties, such as transit camps for Japanese troops from the islands and the war memorial to the Japanese dead on Bukit Timar Hill. That's what Ronnie mentioned just, didn't he? Because um, after <coughs> the fall, um, our men were used to um, build the memorial to the Japanese dead. At this time, the Selarang Square incident occurred in Changi and the parties began leaving there to work on the Burma Railway. After returning to Changi, we were moved to the jail and surrounds, and from there, until repatriation, went daily to work clearing a corner of the Changi area and creating a fighter strip, which still exists, but has grown into the Changi International Airport. My worst personal moments came when I had to appear before the Japanese commandant and an assortment of interpreters to try and explain away to humorless Japanese officers a book of political cartoons that I had drawn. I'd lent the book to a careless person who allowed it to fall into the hands of Japanese guards. And this was at a time when the war was going badly for Germany and Japan, and this was reflected in those cartoons. I was extremely lucky to get away with a whole skin. The Japanese did not approve, and I never saw the book again. And now he was reflecting from those 50 years on. I am now retired from a life of tertiary art education, enjoy the benefits of family and eight grandchildren. And he signed it, Desmond Bettany, ex-Royal Artillery, 1991. So that's my tribute to Des. And um, <clears throat> yeah, my friendship with Keith, um, um, you know, who um, has, has shown me a lot through his dad's um, different things that, uh, been on so there you go Ronnie you've missed all of that <laughs> so I did ask there. the other day because um, if any of you have managed to get up to the art exhibition um oh dear Ronnie um <laughs> then uh, a lot of the artists had to improvise with what they used to do their pictures so I asked Keith about that and he said that because his dad had originally trained before he was uh, <clears> uh, the army um as a chemist or in that way um, he was able to make his pigments and that from the basic uh, things that he had around him. Because if you're familiar with Desi's um, artwork, his, his, his things that he's done are quite colourful, whereas a lot of the other artwork is, is sort of basic colours, uh, usually from the ochre and things like that that they found. Anyway, I'll shut up now if Ronnie's coming back. That's one of my... He's not. He's gone again. He's gone again. He wasn't even there. It was just his chair. <laughs> Anybody got anything else? I hope this is. Does this mean it's not being recorded? Which is probably a relief. <laughs> They're still being recorded. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can do a little bit because I've uh, got some stuff down. If you want. Uh, yeah. Okay. Be... Yes. Please. Go. 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 What, what it is, I got. Um, I went down to queue when I was looking for some information about the prisoner of war camp and my father had been in. Well, the senior commanding officer, um, he was in the Royal Navy, he was called uh, Reed, Commander Reed. And he did uh, a, a, like a, a, a complete document about everything that happened right from the start, all through the camp and all that. 
But the bit that I, I thought was quite interesting was it's a little bit background to their decision to evacuate uh, Singapore. He was actually a Leonzi officer between the Army and the Royal Navy. So he was involved with the decision of when they were going to actually evacuate or try to evacuate as many of the soldiers that they thought they could get out to get the job out. Uh, and surprisingly enough, the, the, they had the main meeting, which was actually on the 13th of February uh, in the morning, and they decided that right, we're going to get as many men out as we can, but we've only got enough ships to carry 2,500 men. So they, uh, they, they organised all that within the day, uh, and so by the evening time, them ships were coming into the harbour, and the men were going to get transported and taken away. Um, obviously, that, that uh, route had been planned out, and the, the route was from Singapore via the Banka Strait to Batvia in Java. That was the plan. And uh, that, that was always something that I always thought was strange, how they didn't know that the Japanese were actually in the Banka Strait in, in Vaden Pelembang. But in his report, he said they didn't know a th one thing about it. They didn't know nothing about that the Japanese were, had, were going to invade Pelembang in the Banka Strait. So they, they, they blindly sent the uh, ships basically to their deaths or capture, whatever. But one of the things that they did say to the captains of the ship was you, you have to travel. Obviously, it was going to take a few days to get down to Java. Was to travel at night, if possible, and during the day, like go up to a little island and cover the ships up with the netting to try and conceal herself, and then travel on at night. But what that, what that meant was that the ships actually took longer to get to the Banka Strait. So that meant that the Japanese were by then in full force. So by telling them to do that, which he thought was the best thing to do, that actually made it worse. In the, that's why so many of the ships that left on the 13th got actually sunk or captured. But I thought it was interesting because he's, uh, it's like he said, he found out that um, he, behind the scenes what was going on. I mean, it must have been total chaos when you think about it. The, uh, the knew the Japanese were going to win or take over Singapore. And uh, they had to come up with some sort of plan, like on the hoof, if you like, you know. So it was quite interesting that that the uh, that was the reason why they sent the ships through the Banka Strait. They just didn't know, basically, that the uh, Japanese were there. So that was uh, my little bit on that. Um, I don't know if you know Michael Pether. He's um, he's really. Uh, Oh, he's probably the best person in the world on the, the evacuation ships from Singapore. I've been in contact with him with it over the last few weeks, and uh, I sent him that document, and he, uh, he, it's, it's like sort of manna from heaven for him, because it's got everything he really like, looks into. It's a, it's a really good research document, because as I say, it's pretty comprehensive. And uh, Commander Reed actually wrote that when he was in the uh, prison camp in Pelhamburg. So that was quite good. Uh, the last bit about uh, February is just like what he said, 1946. That's when my father eventually got home. Uh, February 1946. Uh, but he didn't actually go home straight from uh, he came into Liverpool. Uh, but he was then taken from there to Scotland. And he ended up in a uh, hospital in Scotland for a few months. So by the time he got back to uh, Tyneside, it would have been like March, nearly getting on to April. So it was pretty a long time for him. But February 1946 <coughs> was when he actually got back to uh, England. And that's uh, that's my bit. <laughs> I must apologise anyway. I've got uh, me, and the, me and my wife are both uh, loaded with uh, heavy cold. I don't know how, how you are. But uh, there's been a massive cold epidemic around our place. We are all uh, loaded. We're not coming to see you soon. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was very interesting too. Anybody else got anything? Yeah. 
I was going to ask you, Bob, but did you did you see that post on Facebook about the uh, Imperial War Museum? The uh, Imperial War Museum do a, um, a, like an online memorial. So if you've got a <laughs> memorial um, anywhere in the country, yeah. you could actually put it online. And I noticed the um, the Birmingham one, the, the one in the Bull Ring. Yeah, that's that's there, but there's no picture. The mention of the stone that we, we've got there is yeah, yeah. actually from, from our association. It's it's uh, the actual pages there, but there's no photograph. Right. But what yeah, you can do is, you, if you go on Facebook, you can you can actually go to the Imperial War Museum website, yes. and you click on that, uh, you put in FIBO, you find all the all the FIBO memorials that are around the country, and you'll see the Birmingham one. If you click on that, there's no picture, but there's a little link. And if you click on that, you can actually send a picture and then they'll, they'll put it on for you. Ah, thank you for that. I'll, I'll try and follow yeah. that through. That's super. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, it's on, um, it's on Facebook. If you have a look at the, yeah. the link, all the links and all that's on there. Yes. Oh, super. Yeah, because I say normally on Tuesday we would go. But I mean, maybe you know that we our honorary chairman is a FIPO. He's um, 96. He'll be 97 in May. And um, very, very, you know, uh, he doesn't want any help or assistance, especially walking. Um, but he, he's not all that well now, as you can understand. And it's too far for him to work, walk from where we are to where that particular memorial is. So out of respect for him, you know, we, we sort of haven't been. Um, he, he refuses to use a wheelchair, although when we, when we took them to RAF Cosford last year, we hired a mobility scooter from him and he was like, we'd given him a Ferrari, he was off and away. It was lovely. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, out of respect, he is our main centre of attention. You know, everything we do is centred around him for as long yes. as he is alive because, you know, we remember our fee pose. Um, so, yeah, and I tried to um, get uh, another memorial. The memorial that sits in St Martin's in the Bull Ring is purely for those that didn't come back. Yeah. And um, I'm sure that you, as um, the descendants of uh, Afipo, know what the ones that returned went through. And I also feel that they need recognition. And I was hoping to get a memorial stone put there. We had a peal of bells done on September the 2nd, 2018. Um, and we hoped to have a peal board commemorating that. But the actual bell tower said they didn't um, want to. They also turned down our donation of £500, which was strange. Um, but things are heading up for this year. And although we might not um, uh, get uh, the stone done there, there are, in um, St Philip's Cathedral, I, I went and had a look round with um, our, um, one of our other members the other day. There's quite a big memorial. Um, I was looking all around the walls for something to mention um, Bishop uh, Leonard Wilson. And uh, my friend suddenly said, be careful where you're standing. And I, I looked down and there was a big stone on the floor leading up to the altar in recognition of um, Leonard Wilson. I thought the wording was strange because it actually said he was the sometime Bishop of Singapore. I don't know quite what sometime means, but I found that a bit of a strange description of um, a man who actually helped save um, and keep people going while he, his time was over there. And particularly when the 10th of the 10th incident happened, he did an awful lot there to try and save lives um, from the Japanese executing uh, people there. I know they did execute a lot of Chinese, I think it was, but um, yeah. So um, we intend to sort of perhaps do something in recognition of uh, Leonard Wilson's contribution to, to uh, keeping the morale of the troops going and, and the local civilians. Um, during those years, but, um, that, that's that. <laughs> yeah. We look forward okay. to uh, doing it. Yeah. I'll, sh I'll try and share the screen for that there. Um. Ah. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'll yeah, look at that. Right. Yeah, that's the that's the actual main page. If you go down to the to the yeah. table. <coughs> okay, that's that's really good. 
Yes, I'll try and because I've got photographs um, of our um, memorial. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just well, very that's basic. That's, yeah, that's that's the ones that's actually on. Yeah. Yeah, okay. the, they, they've got uh, that's your Birmingham one. Which, Birmingham uh, branch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think Brilliant. that was the one. Uh, that gives you where where the actual location is. Yeah. And that's the that's the Saint Martin's in the Bull Ring. That's it. That's where it is. Yes. Yeah. 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 So th it's obviously there's no picture there, but if you all you do yeah. is if you click on that link, yes. this one here, uh, uh -huh. and you can send in send in a photograph. I'll try and get that done today. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. it's open to everybody. I mean, it's not uh, yeah. it, you can put anything on it. They, obviously, they look at it, and make sure that it's uh, okay, you know. But yeah. uh, it's open to everybody. And I thought, well, okay. of course, with it being the 75th anniversary, it would be nice to have. All it would memorials because there's quite a few, not no pictures, you know. Yeah, no, I should try and get that done. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, Tim, what about you? Where was where was your FIPO uh, on the fifteenth? Um, well, go back to February. Let's tell us into what Kevin was saying because my dad was. Uh, in one of the light anti-aircraft batteries, well, the battery that was sent from Singapore with the heavy arch, um, anti-aircraft artillery was actually in Palembang, and it was actually on the 14th that the paratroopers landed on top of them. Oh, gosh. So um, that's probably why if it, if Kevin was talking about the 13th. They probably didn't know the Japanese were actually there. Yeah. As I say, it was, it was paratroopers that came in first of all. Before the landings took place. Yeah. I've actually got another bit of use. This. I was going to say, Tim, I, 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 I'm trying to find it. There was one of them, uh, the documents, see, because of the, obviously they asked other people uh, about what had happened and things like that. And there was an account of um, somebody must have been in the, the it was on the airfields as the anti tank anti aircraft gunner, and uh, they didn't actually manage to get the job, or they were like sort of got lost, and they, they ended up wandering, wandering away down to try and get to the coast, but actually got captured by the Japanese, and they actually what? ended up in the Pelembang prison of war camp. Oh, right. I'll that document, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's, it was quite good. Oh, right. That'd be, that'd be quite interesting, because I tried, I tried to follow as much as I can of his battery, you know, and... Uh... There's quite, there's a fair bit about it uh, around, and there's a very good account of the uh, Pelham Bangs or incident, you want to call it, by the Colonel of the Six HAA, who mysteriously managed to get the sack when they got to Java and actually got got sent out of Java by. <laughs> uh, which was all a bit of a mystery, but. <laughs> But I don't think you could have been, I don't think you're a very good CO because there's a book by uh, Ken Attiwill called The Right The Rising Sunset who actually makes a remark that, you know, he was glad that the CO had gone because he wasn't any good to them where they were. <laughs> <clears throat> actually um, there's a, a bit of actually useless information which I'll pass on, which actually has absolutely nothing to do with the 15th of February, but I was reading something else. I don't know if anyone knows, but in June 1941, when uh, Operation Barbarossa, you know, Hitler's invasion of Russia started, Churchill sent 50 tanks to Russia, 50 Matilda tanks, and they were actually destined for Singapore. <laughs> and he changed, changed the orders and sent them to Russia to help the Russians. So if that hadn't been countermanded, the, they would have had 50 tanks in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember reading, you know, the 18th Division that uh, well, was sent to Singapore. They, they, they had a ship with the uh, REOC on, but they also had, I think they had armament or, or armored cars or, or uh, some sort of armored vehicles in the ship, but the ship got bombed in the harbor. And they, they went to fire and they couldn't save anything. The men well, they did, they, yeah, they did have some that got off in uh, Java, didn't they? Some, some uh, 
Um, I can't remember which one it was now. I think it was a, a battery of the uh, or troop of the King's Hussars or something. I can look it up, but certainly, certainly they had some. You say I think they. I don't know whether they were actually heavily armoured cars or very light tanks. I think they were light tanks. Yeah. But they were they were they were too late. In fact, I think actually, I think actually they went up to um, Sumatra first of all, but were turned round as soon as they got there, and then went back down to. Uh, um, Java. Yeah, yeah. I think it goes what back to what I was, what I was saying about the because the, the communication basically must have broke down completely. So it, it must have been totally. It's virtually like a like a modern warfare. You have to have the communication to to, to see what's going on, and that's such a vast mm. area. You, you, you can't imagine why what happened actually did happen because. It was impossible to tell people what was going on. Mm. Well, I'm, another another thing I find quite surprising as well. Um, when when troops got sent to Africa or Egypt, anyway, they got about three weeks off to acclimatise. You know, before they were actually sent anywhere. Yeah. These these poor chaps in Singapore were actually pouring off the ship into, you know, having having been at sea and therefore reasonably unfit, completely unacclimatized, completely into jungle, which they'd never seen before. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing, you know, they were, they were expected to be able to do anything. Yeah. Well, that's what I always see, uh, the people who were in the 18th Division always <clears throat> said that, that was a, why, why we were sent there, it was too late anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I mean, even, even my dad's lot, which was before the 18th Division, well, some of, some of them came with the 18th Division, but it, his um, artillery regiment, I mean, that, that arrived in, uh, in uh, January, so but before the main part of the 18th Division. But, but they, even so, they, they only had about three weeks in Singapore, and then they were sent down to Java. Well, Sumatra, rather. Yeah. And even, even then, it was I think it was fairly chaotic, and they didn't stay long in Sumatra at all. They had to go down to Java, and by the time they got to Java, you know, they got, got some of the guns down to the bottom of Sumatra, but then they couldn't. <clears throat> There's two accounts. I never actually quite got to the bottom of it. One account says, they couldn't get the guns through the roads because the roads were jammed up with, you know, abandoned vehicles. And another says they actually got to the port, but there was no no ship that they could get the guns onto. So of course, when they ended up in Java, they got no guns with them. But who's next? Sophie hasn't said anything yet. It's only me left. <laughs> um, well, in, in uh, for, for February, I've only really got two. Um, I keep going back to my dad, dad's liberation questionnaire to check the details. Um, so in in February 1942, um, he'd already been captured basically in mid January on the 17th of January. Um, and he were, at that time he would have been in um, Taiping jail, which I think also had another name on the on the last meeting. Um, I got a little bit more information about that and looked it up. Um, yeah, um, and uh, he, he stayed there until the um, July of that year, and then went to Kuala Lumpur jail um, until the October. When he went to um, Nong Pladuk. Um, the the other entry I've got for um, uh, something happening in in um, February or a different year for him was in February 1945 when um, he went he was taken from Nong Pladuk um, where he'd ended back up after a succession of different camps um, up to Ubon in northeast Thailand, which obviously 
um, would have been um, a big change. I think that, you know, they were going from effectively a, um, the railway environment jungle up to um, what I understand was pretty much sort of just open fields, things like that. So, and I'm not sure about the sort of climatic differences and stuff up there, but I imagine it was very, it must have been very different. Um, not sure, quite sure whether maybe it would have been um, a relief to get out of, of non Plymouth. I don't know. Um, it's, it's my understanding that perhaps things were a little bit different up in Ubon, maybe a little bit better. Um, although it's all relative, you know, obviously better is not better, but um, yeah, is it, you know, obviously um, Ray Whitner has done a lot of research on Ubon um, up there. Um, yeah, and he stayed there until obviously the the surrender. So, um, but that's really all I've got to say about February because obviously he he wasn't in Changi or any anywhere like that. He'd he'd already been, you know, he was already in um, capture for a month before Singapore fell. So, because um, he was up in Belaya at the time, so basically he got taken before that. If anybody has got any more details about either um, Taiping Jail or Kuala Lumpur Jail, I'd, I'd really like to know. I know somebody has mentioned last on the call oh, last time that one of them had a different name, and I can't, I can't remember now. I did write it all down at the time, but um, yeah, I mean the the stuff that I um, looked up suggested it was similarly bad to to other places. Um, yeah, so it would be interesting to find that out. Yeah. Did, uh, Sophie, did uh, Ray not actually b uh, visit that, the, the jail in Kuala Lumpur? Is he, is um, he was over possibly, there uh, yeah. Yeah, I think he said, I think he, QC was on the call last time, and he, I think it was him who said, oh, yeah, it's, it's called, um, you probably won't find it listed as that, you'll find it called this or something. And I immediately went away and looked. And, and sort of saw some pictures of some survi surviving remnants of it and things like that. So, um, yeah, so, it's, so I've, I've just written, I've written it down somewhere and I forgot now, just off <laughs> what it's called. I need to um, make sure I get all my information together. But yeah, it's just, it's just a different, you know, it's like a different experience from, from others, I suppose. So, um, you know, it's just interesting to know a little bit about that as well. Um, well, I wonder, I wonder if there is, has Ray really got um, like an old map of Kuala Lumpur from uh, the 1941. Probably, yeah. I, I need to ask yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, I think I would, because uh, actually my, my, uh, my father was in Kuala Lumpur. They had a, a face mm. what I call a uh, workshop. They used to they keep maintain the vehicles and stuff like that. And it was the... Okay. Um, uh, it'll, it'll obviously the, the place has been completely rechanged now. It obviously um, mm. Kuala Lumpur is like a, a mega, like a new modern city <clears> now. So the, probably all their places have been redeveloped. But it would be interesting yeah. to see like an old map, you know, to see uh, where everything was, you know. But because uh, yeah, he it got, be, um, be, yeah, because yeah, he got evacuated, uh, it would have been like the like the, when the Japanese invaded. Obviously, the the Non, like we're called non-combatants, if you like, would have been withdrawn to Singapore. And he, ended, he ended up going back in uh, January. So the, obviously the, the the men fighting would have been fighting like a rear, rear guard action, if you like, all the way down the peninsula. But the, the, the non-combatants, like uh, the workshops, they were evacuated back to Singapore uh, probably just the beginning or mid-January. Hi Bernard, your uh, your dad was uh, he was in the 18th division, wasn't he? Your EOC. He was on. Sorry. He was in the he was on the 18th division. Yes. EOC, yeah. Wasn't he? Yeah. So if yeah. he would have been on, probably been on that ship that got bombed. Was it the uh, Empress of Asia? The ship he was uh, on. No, I don't think he was on that. No. No. I got very little uh, 
information. Uh, Wakefield, he was on. Have you heard about that? That ship? No, no. Yeah, the, Wake, it's one of the USS Wakefield. Wakefield, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right, yes, yeah. 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 That was yeah. part of the 18th, that was the main 18th Division lot. Yeah. Now, when I was in the Army, I, well, I went on a troop ship. It was called uh, the Empress of Pakistan. And I can remember um, Keith was telling me that uh, that ship was in service when I was, it's the same ship that was in the war that that I went on in 1956. Mm. And that, I mean, I sailed a very short journey from from England to Holland, the Hook of Holland, and that was a terrible ship. <laughs> we, we were like we were like sardines on it. So I don't know how they managed to get. Uh, to Singapore on on these troop ships, it was terrible. You know, I think, I think some of them weren't too bad. My my dad actually left uh, the UK on the Empress of Japan, would you believe? So. Right. Which then oh, got to reach the Empress of Scotland. <laughs> yeah, we used to sail. Uh, everything had to be overnight, sort of thing. We sailed from. England to uh, the Hook of Holland, and then we travelled by train then to, I think it was Hanover, we changed trains there, and then we couldn't go through on to um, uh, Berlin, only by night, so, so we had to wait then, and uh, travel through, through the the Russian sector in Berlin to to get to the British sector, pull all the blinds down, couldn't look out the windows, <laughs> you know. So uh, that was quite an experience. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I went on that train, but it was about 1970 when I did it. Yeah, quite good. I think they used to take a fair number well. of stops on the way, didn't they? Because I'm looking here at um, key dates from the diary of. Um, Fred Fox, who was uh, out in Saigon as well, but um, his key dates here, um, saying when he, they sailed on, this is when they left England to go off. So the 30th of August, 41, they sailed uh, from England. On the 13th of September, they they were in Freetown in South Af West Africa. Uh, the 30th of September, they were in Cape Town. Uh, then. Uh, it's a bit obliterated there, but then they went to Bombay. The 30th of October, they were in Ceylon, and then the 6th of November, they reached Singapore. So I think they did get breaks from the ships that were carrying them, their particular ones. And then he's just put that uh, the 7th yeah. of December, they were at war with Japan, and the 15th of September, mm. of, um, sorry, February, Singapore fell. Um, and on the 17th of February, uh, Fred was in um, Changi, and his mother learnt that he was a POW. His next um, uh, key date is when he sailed on the Nishimaru, uh, same as my dad, out to Saigon. Uh, they left the 4th of April. Um, but it's, it's interesting, looking back at things, because I wanted to find out something for today about, about my dad. And I knew that he was in the woodlands um, area. Um, but then I got very distracted, because I was very lucky, some time ago, Keith, bless him, came across some things in queue. I don't know if any of you have been lucky enough to have these. These are all the orders. Oh, yes. Um, and they are very dark, but on the one, right on the back page, I don't know how I've missed it before, because my dad been in searchlights. Um, I won't find it now. But I know that he... There was always talk that my dad wasn't just searchlights. He was on sound recognition or sound development. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. And nobody ever seems to know what, what I mean when I say about that. So when I, I saw do. that on, on those orders, <laughs> oh, right, you can tell me. Um, and some time ago, sorry about showing you all these, this, this little bit here, that's appeared in a Wolverhampton newspaper. 
um, with an ex-soldier in bid to find POW comrade. Um, and right at the bottom, um, he put, um, Mr. Slater was a searchlight operator, and Mr. Taylor, that's my dad, was on sound location apparatus or equipment. And then tying in again with that, one day um, took my grandson out, who was um, doing a project on World War Two uh, at school, and I bought him one of these sets with cards in and things like that. And one of these cards mentioned this sound location that um, Dad was on. Um, so you know, I've, I've always tried to find out quite what they meant by sound location. But the one thing about my dad, um, as I grew up, um, there was um, when they bought their first house, um, there was a shed at the bottom of the garden, um, falling apart when they took it over. And he put up there, there was, he had his, his cap with his badges and all his war things seemed to be put in this shed. And he'd got a picture of aircraft and we'd be down there. And if we heard an aircraft coming over, he would change, he would be listening, he would be saying, that's a such and such coming over. So I think that that stayed with my dad, you know, all this having to listen, you know, out for aircraft. Um, and it's strange how, you know, that if that brings back all those memories of my dad and, and how he was affected really when he came back. Well, but come on, can you tell me about what the sound location was then? I know down south somewhere they use these things. Well, I, know, I, I, actually, I actually know more about them on the south coast of England, but oh, where they actually the built. Ones, yeah. actually but then Dad worked down great, in the great big, docks. Um, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they had great, great big, mainly concrete sort of yeah. things. Uh, yeah. But they will, they will I, have I, had mobile ones as well. And that's, that's going to say they've got to be mobile. I'll, I'll look it. I'll, I'll look it. I'll look it up, Barbara, and see if I can find anything. Oh, that would be yeah, fascinating yeah. if you could. That's right. Yeah, yeah there must they, they be they actually, mobile units. Yeah, yeah. 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 They predated the radar. Busy word is yeah. the sound. That that's I right. Yeah. Dish. And the sound was they like, concentrated into one point, just like a, you could see like a radar dish if you like, but it was the sound. So they, they were actually the first things I had to try and. Mm. Get an early warning of aircraft coming. I think I think, I think, I think Tim, I've seen. I think I've seen a program where they had it, had them on the on the on the co on the coastline, big massive yeah. concrete thing. Yes, yeah, so I've I've seen those, but I was thinking those can't relate to my dad because you know, remember my dad yeah. would have to be mobile. Um, but it's just interesting, you know, and especially when that um, friend of his was looking for him, you know, that um, that confirmed yeah. it, and then looking through those uh, documents that Keith had got for me. To actually see that this equipment was mentioned, um, because as you say, mm -hmm. it predates the radar. And my dad was very good at maths, so I think they had to work out um, angles and things for shooting, yes. and um, which way the guns had to, you know, the angle of the elevation for firing the guns, that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah it was just another aspect of the war, wasn't it? Mm. Mm -hmm. Just going back to what Barbara had there, the war diary. If you haven't got the war diary of, you know, whatever your relative yeah. said, it's well worth trying to see if you can find them. You say, oh, very interesting. I've got my dad's for his regiment. Unfortunately, it actually ends in the end of January, January 42. And uh, it always intrigues me how they must have got some of these war diaries actually out of Singapore before they before it got captured. <coughs> but um, his, his is an actual war diary. When I say actual, I mean it was actually written at the time because it's signed by the colonel commanding the regiment and he got uh, died as one of the Gunners 600 party, so it must be a real one because some of them which got lost and reconcocted after the war and they're not maybe not quite so accurate. But they really are interesting because it tells you, you know, who went where? Well, it, they do depend. Depends how good the writer was. The writer yeah. was a you know eloquent sort of thing. He he writes lots and puts all the information in. But um, I actually found it even more interesting as to when the regiment was in the UK because it actually tells you the precise location that each battery and each troop was sent to, and they were sent all over the place. You know, but. When they were in Singapore, it's interesting because it tells you which batteries and which troops went actually up into Malaya and which ones went to the naval base and which ones went to the airfield and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Tim, where do you yeah. get those from? They're, Sorry, they're held in the National you. Archives. Yeah. Okay, the best right. person, the best person is to ask. You. In fact, if if you go on a a thing called Discovery, Discovery is probably discovery.co.uk. I don't know, but anyway, it's the National Archives uh, mm. website. You can type in there. There's a search thing. And you can put the regiments in there, and okay. it will come up and show you whether they actually do hold the war, war diary. You have to be a bit careful when you're putting in the search because <laughs> sometimes they're called, you know, LAA regiment. Sometimes they're called light anti-aircraft regiment. Sometimes it's called, you know, workshop this. And you have to get it near enough right <laughs> for the search okay. engine to pick it up. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's also but, but worth Keith saying... would be the best expert if you if you can find one and you need okay. to copy. Yeah. Yeah. The Imperial War Museum, because I was sent some time ago by um um by Frank Clark. I don't know if any of you from Cofipo know of Frank uh, Clark, who is very use, um, very you know inspirational to me. Um, and I've got a list here of what he sent me that's held at the Imperial War Museum. Some of them are diaries, um, and some of them are the actual sound recordings. But um, last summer, when we had a, a nice summer day, I did actually sit in the, the garden um, and used it as an excuse not to move for three hours while I listened to um, uh, one of these sound recordings. And I learned so much from, you know, just okay. listening to their actual, their voices, their experience uh, coming across. So, and that was just, um, uh, on that day, was just doing a research for Imperial War Museum. Um, so it is worth having a, and you know, we look through what they've got, um, and it's nice to listen to these these chaps and you know telling us how it really was. And, that, mm. and also, let's let's um, you know thank goodness some of these uh, diaries came back because the uh, uh, art exhibition in uh, Liverpool really was um, inspired by one of these. That was Meg Parks's father's diary that he brought back, mostly written uh, because he was uh, imprisoned in Japan. Um, so these diaries, you know, spark off lots of um, research and good things. And thank goodness um, Meg Parks' his dad kept his diary and uh, inspired a lot of what uh, research and the conferences that she's done. So um, we will, some of us will be meeting up, I presume, at the next conference. Are you going, Kevin? To which one, sorry? The uh, yeah. f research in FIPO history conference. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't think I really care about it. As I say, I'm just longing to retire so I can do all this sort of stuff. I can, when, when you're working, it's pretty <laughs> difficult to, to do anything. I, I don't know where yeah, the time goes, you know. It's, uh, it's really, yeah. really It's difficult. over a weekend. It's the 5th to the 7th of June. It could possibly be the last one, um, you know, oh, if you do yeah, get sure. a chance. Um, I, I'm not saying it is. Um, but it's linked, I presume, to the art exhibition um, because it'll oh, be yeah, yeah. medical things, I should think. Yeah. yeah. Tim, are you well, going to that yeah, one? Yeah. I'm definitely uh, trying to get up I to doubt the art. Yeah. I, live, I live in Scotland, so it's a bit far from me. Well, yeah. It's, um, in Liverpool, do, it's not. It's not I really actually do want to get down there because um, Meg Parks' father was actually with my dad quite a lot of the time. We were in two camps there together. So. Yeah, I've got both well, both his I've got both his books sitting there. Notify yeah. Alec Rattery and A.A. Duncan is okay. And that the yeah. second one I got, Meg's actually signed it for me. So. Oh bless her! Yeah, I mean she's amazing what she's done and achieved, and um, keep trying to plug this Art of Survival exhibition. <laughs> Everybody gets a chance to go. And um, sometimes in the evenings, if you do go up there and you stay a few days, um, do look it up. Um, they've got sort of extra things on in the evenings where people are giving in talks. I wish I lived closer to Liverpool. I could have popped along, but it's a bit far just to, to go from um, Brummyland. But um, really good. And of course, it finishes in June, June the 20th. So um, plan, your, plan your trips. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I see Bob Ruddy, um I have been, been doing a bit of like research in this the like the my father's company. And I was actually one of the men did end up in Sing uh, Saigon. All right. And uh, I found a, a um I found a thing, you know the that thing it's called the the People's War, the BBC did it a long time ago. Yes. Yeah. And um they have can you see that there? Yes. Oh yeah. 
Oh, yes. I've, yeah, I think I've been onto is, that. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, an account of somebody who was in uh, Saigon. Yeah. What's his name? But it's amazing how you can find just different things. You're looking for something, you find something yeah. else in there. That was, and it, yeah, takes you on these trails, doesn't it? It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Like mm. you did this morning but, with me with the sound locator. Um, yeah. You know, it took me off what my dad it. was doing. Mm. Yeah, and that, that one was a, a recording. That's, a, like you say, from the Imperial War Museum. Yeah. That's a, like somebody else who was in Saigon. Yeah, there's a whole uh, group of them actually from Saigon that are recorded at the Imperial Museum yeah, War yeah. Museum. Um, yeah, but I, I found one. it um, really interesting. He, he did make it sound a bit like a holiday camp because um, he was an officer and so they were slightly treated differently, weren't they? <laughs> um, <laughs> I won't bring out my grumbles on that. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I've heard they, them before. But have you, yeah. Well, yeah, we were discussing this at our last meeting and I, I just happened to say something about, you know, it, it was a bit shameful how some of these officers, not all of them, but not all of them, but some of these officers really use their rank um, to um, have, have not a bad time always and, um, yeah, made sure they looked after themselves when really they're, they should have been looking after the, the ordinary yeah. men. I mean, once you're yeah. a captive, basically, you're all equal. Yeah. yeah. Barbara, was that the, the ship he, the, your dad was taking? No, my dad was with the. You, 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 have you seen the prisoners list, the book, the prisoners list? No. no. Um, that there were about a thousand of them. That they were the first ones sent out in April 1942, and then others. Um, if you can see Ronnie Taylor's name is there. His dad came later, um, uh, okay. and joined them there. So. Yeah, there were there were different times that people were sent out. Ronnie Taylor's dad came a lot later after he'd been on the uh, railway. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, that, dad, I think that was that the ship that they, they were actually going to go to Japan, but uh, there was threats of submarines in the area or something. Yeah. So they decided to put him into Saigon. That's probably it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, don't you know, think you know, so. I think I think they actually went direct to Saigon. I think they were destined uh, to go to Saigon, weren't they? Ah, right. Yeah. It was one one of the first ones to leave uh, Singapore, anyway. Yeah, the the one that but, my dad was on that was destined for Saigon. Um, I think yeah, they they weren't yeah. sure the Japanese what to do with all these cap you know prisoners that they've yeah. got. So um, they were developing things out in um, Saigon, and they wanted to build airstrips because Dad went and worked on an airstrip for a time at Fumi or Pumi, Pahumi. Um, but mostly he was on the docks and although, um, you know, I was told, oh, well, it was like a holiday camp compared to some of them. When I, when you read and you listen to the conditions there, it, it wasn't. I mean, my dad had, had all his teeth knocked out for refusing to salute the Japanese flag. He'd got scars on his back where he was whipped with a sword as well for insubordination or, you know, refusing again to uh, salute the higher command of the Japanese. Korean guards, he, he said, were horrible. Um, and he'd um, clear in jungle to build the um, airstrip. He'd got, um, he had a snake bite, which was, they cut it out of his leg. So he'd got like a hole in his leg. So he wasn't in a holiday camp. I'd hate yeah. to go to a holiday camp like that. But um, there you go. <laughs> it probably I, wasn't I as bad I, as being on the railway. I think when, when they use the expression holiday camp, uh, I, I think it depends where else you were. Because yeah. um, there was something on Facebook <coughs> about Changi. Um, someone said, oh, they said it was a holiday camp, and everyone said, oh, no, it definitely wasn't. But I'm trying to think. I'm, I, tried to, I think I was listening to a sound recording like you, Barbara. It was only last week, mm -hmm. and it was someone who'd been up on the railway. And they came back down from the railway to Changi, and they actually said, like, going on holiday compared to what they've uh, been through. Yes, oh, I can you imagine. Know, and uh, yeah. he said the food was better. You know, the discipline was all right. It was, you know, all regimented, and <clears throat> and it really was. And said, you know, it felt like a holiday camp, but that's yeah. compared to <laughs> yeah what they'd had before. Yeah, and it isn't just purely the the physical conditions and the lack of medical support and that. To me, it's it was the unknown. It, the psychological effect on these men must have been huge because you know they'd never. I mean, as much as they say the Japanese hadn't seen Europeans, I don't think our men knew what to make of the Japanese. 
the the whole mm. cultural ethic of Japanese with Bushido and all these sort of things. Um, you know, it's a different thing. And, and psychologically, I think our men, you know, you never know from one day to the next whether you're going to be alive, or whether you'll be beheaded. Yeah. Um, you know, I was reading the other day about somebody had put on um, different things. Oh, it was Martin. Why is Martin today? Uh, had put on um, some files that he'd found. And there was even one thing there about um, a blonde American uh, woman who'd been beheaded, you know, and, and watching things like this going on around them. It's that constant fear of not knowing, you know, what the psyche of these Japanese and Korean guards were, were because, um, you know, they, they were cruel. They were really, really cruel. Um, yeah. And I mean, listening with last um, fortnight or so over the build up to the Holocaust Day, it, it does make my blood boil, you know, as probably told you all before. You know, when you, you look at the Japanese as they moved down through China from about 1933 onwards and what they did and the massacres and things. And nobody seems to recognise or commemorate the poor souls that lost their lives. Um, I mean, you know, in Singapore, you know, as I mentioned in um, Des Bettany's thing about the rows and rows of heads that were put on spikes along the roads that the prisoners walked past. Um, you know, psychologically, the Japanese, you know, there's an element there of brutality, but that's their, that's their almost inheritance, if you like. That's how um, Japanese life was with the samurai and, and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, there was a lot of uh, violence. And war is a violent theatre anyway, isn't it? And no side is ever, you know, <laughs> we all commit atrocities of one sort or another. But when they commemorate all the um, awful um, things that were done in the uh, Holocaust in Europe, they, they should make mention of it. I mean, I, I sent three messages to um, the mayor of uh, London, um, reminding him because he was say, sound, making himself sound awfully good because there's an election coming up, um, you know, and doing all these things. And he went out. Um, to the service at, um, gosh, my brain isn't working, um, to commemorate the um, victims of the Holocaust. And I thought, well, are you going to go out to Singapore? You know, are you going to commemorate all the things over there? I wouldn't think yeah. so. They won't get a mention. But there you go. Sorry. Yeah. Shut up. The, there was one thing, uh, just like what Bruno said, a few, uh, about two, couple of years ago, I went to Berlin for a, like, yeah. a, like a long weekend. And uh, what I found is that the Germans have actually come to terms with that. They they, they recognise what they did was wrong, and they have a they do have a big massive uh, um, memorial for the Holocaust. But uh, not far from Berlin, there is a they have a, a concentration camp. It's not like the really bad ones, but these were like for political prisoners, and they have it as a, a monument for the really not just for people to go and see but it's for there is a reminder of uh, what they did and they're, they're quite happy to well he's not say happy but they're, they're quite willing to accept what they did was wrong in yeah. the, the, the let people see what they did was wrong and i think that with the japanese it, it's they still don't really recognize what they did was wrong no, that's that you, you're not, right not, not there. Like they the don't. Germans, you know, not like the Germans, you know, not like the Germans. Mm. Yeah, I, I no. found that was really good. I mean, you, 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 what the Germans did was terrible. The Holocaust was an absolute disgrace. But at least the Germans have tried to do something about it. You know, they've actually yeah. said, look, we did that and uh, we'll regret it. And this is the monument of that uh, mistakes that mm. we made in, during the war. Yeah. But there was a lot of the Germans never knew what was going on, wasn't there? I mean, what I've yeah. seen on the television, is, uh, a lot of the German public didn't know what was going on, didn't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised. I mean, I know very little about uh, uh, my father's uh, service in the army, only what I've been told, and half of that is wrong. But... Um, you know, I've I've forgotten what I'm going to say now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I got very little information from where I live here. Uh, I speak to people on the on the on the street, and uh, you talk about Changi, and they say, "Well, 
where's Changi? Mm. Well, what was Changi? Mm. You know, they just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that uh, uh, I have gleamed off different people about uh, what my father went through, you know, and because um, I was brought up with my grandmother, my mother's mother. And she had lost her husband in the First World War, and she had married again. And my step-grandfather told me a load of rubbish. And I believed it at the time, but uh, it was wrong. And now, uh, something has happened now. My sister's granddaughter, uh, she'd been doing research, and uh, she came on to me the other day and she said, you you know, I got one of those big penny medals, you know, which was my grandfather's. I, I, I was always told it, it was my grandfather's, you see. And uh, I looked after it and I mounted it in a, a frame, you know, and it hangs on the wall. And she said, um, that man isn't your grandfather. And I said, what do you mean he's not my grandfather? Well, she said, you know that DNA I took off you the other day? And she, I said, yes. She said, there's no match. And that man, who you think is your grandfather, isn't your grandfather. And yet I've been all through my life, look, believing that that man was my grandfather. You know what? What? Um, what? What people are telling me now? I, I, I just can't believe it. Mm. I, I, I gleamed more from you uh, than what I would ever have found out. Mm. You know, I, I got think that's no one what's to ask. Lovely now. about 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 things like this, where we do go on, because we don't just talk about our own things. I think we do, and um, I hope that people who watch the videos also pick up and um, follow up on things that we talk yeah. about. I know from when we have our meetings, um, you know, there's, there's lots of help goes out to ones who who've come along yeah. new to our group and, and whatever. And, and, and that's what we're here for is, yeah. you know, not just to find out about our own, um, but to yeah. inspire people to go and, and learn the bigger picture. I mean, yeah. I'll give you a funny incident. So at the, the day of our last, um, you know, it was our committee meeting, um, I uh, persuaded the treasurer of our group to come with me to um, a place. We were having some badges made for our VJ75 celebration, um, just as a free gift. It's, it's nothing like the big medallion we had done last time. Um, but when we got to the place and um, came in, the, we actually were given a guided tour of this um, uh, little unit, this factory that makes them. And um, the... Um, the, the guy who's taken us around, when I said, oh, it's the VJ75, of course, we got the usual... Oh, Ronnie looks very attractive. There's, a, there's a ghost in the background. <laughs> but, uh, Ronnie got I was a generator. Able, I able to um, explain to him what the badge was for and what we were commemorating. And he knew nothing about the Second World War and the FIPOs. So I ended up giving him a load of information. And um, hmm. we're going to get them to do the badge for us. And I've said, if you would like to um, use the badge that we're having made for the VJ75 commemoration as part of your advertising campaign, please do. I said, because we want to get the word out about what VJ75 means. You know, so I think, you know, for me, like Ray has done, I mean, what Ray's saying they've been doing for the Normandy um, landings and everything um, is amazing. You know, it's just getting out there and letting people know what what happened, whether it be just through our father's stories or through the whole thing, because um, it's important that um, that everybody I, knows. I don't, yeah, I don't know how long I'm going to last. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah, I don't know how long I'm going to last because I've just wired up my uh, router to my arts. So, do you want to borrow my generator, Ron? <laughs> yeah, I need something. Uh, no, that is really bad outside, so I can see it. We, our mains is always going off. Anyway, what I'll do is I'll 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 leave in a minute because I don't think my ups is going to last too long. Um, but I'll, what I'll do is I'll post when the mains come back on. I'll post what I've just 
I've got on the paper onto the people, families who can all read it. And uh, hope that's been a good meeting. Um, We've had a good time. <laughs> yeah, without me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I'm, I'm yeah. ever sorry, but. Uh, uh, you're actually I'm looking go quite on. ghostly. <laughs> I, well, I've got my torch. Looks as though you're not really with us, but you are. <laughs> yeah. It should be a Halloween meeting with you at the moment. The torch <laughs> isn't back up. Not like that. <laughs> Better? <laughs> anyway, I'll leave you all now. I'll turn the record off because I, w I might not be able to get back in. Um, so I'll turn anyway. the cord off now. Is, is that okay with everyone? Yeah, yeah that's fine. I'm going to yeah. say goodbye to you all anyway. And, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. So well, yeah. seven o'clock. Bye, bye, bye to everyone. Oh, yeah. Barbara, bye. seven o'clock <laughs> next time. Seven o'clock. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that is seven o'clock. Yeah, okay, I did put it seven. <laughs> yeah, see you later. All right, bye. Okay, bye. 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 Everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Bye. so I'll I'll turn the record off now, and you can chat as long as as long as you like. But I think mine's near enough had it, okay? So turn the record off.